Hi students, welcome to the Baiju Sindhu News Analysis for 26th of August 2018. So let's get started. So let's look into the first article. So the first article says major cases and the collegium a study. So what is this all about? So let's get back to the background. So when we look into the background, what was happening in Jan 2018 was in the history of independent India, first time the judiciary came out into the media and said that there were certain discrepancies and these discrepancies was with reference to the Chief Justice of India that he was selectively picking cases and he was giving preferential treatment and giving those cases as per his convenience rather than giving importance to the collegium. So what is the context that we are driving right now? It goes on to say that Chief Justice Deepak Misra's role as the master of the roster was called into question by other four judges in the Supreme Court collegium in January while their company complaint was cases being assigned selectively to the benches of preference who have members of the collegium being represented in the major cases. So what we will be discussing in detail in this article is how is that the collegium has been represented in the past from the year 1999. So this survey or this study has basically taken how many judgments have been passed and how many people have been represented in the benches. So what we will be understanding from 1999 is how is that the collegium has performed in delivering the judgments. So first thing that we will have to understand in this case is why is year 1999 taken? So why 1999 is taken as a reference point for this that is from January 1999 is because we will have to head back to 1998. So what happens in 1998? So there was one of the important things that happened and that is the third judge's case. So in third judge's case, what happens is K.R. Narayanan as a president issues a presidential reference to the Supreme Court. So he asks the Supreme Court if the consultation with the CGI involves only the CGI or it does it also involve a collegium. Collegium here means is the consultation of the other judges important. So what happened in the second judge's case? It was only two senior most judges was considered. But what the Supreme Court said in 1998 third judge's case was it is the consultation of four senior most judges. So what does this mean? So in this consultation what it means is the CGI as well as the other four judges will be taken into picture and whatever they say will be the final consultation. So it is not only the consultation of the Chief Justice of India but it also includes the four senior most judges. So all these together include five. That is you have the CGI who is ranking first in the list and then followed by four senior most judges and all these people together become a part of the collegium. So that is why 1999 is taken as the reference in this study. The simple reason is because that is when the collegium as a whole was established. That is when four senior most judges as well as the CGI came into picture. That is why 1999 is taken as a reference point to come to a conclusion as per the study. So what we will have to understand in this case is what is the result. So when we look into the results, what we will have to understand is that any constitutional bench or any bench which is set up is set up by the Chief Justice of India. Why? Because he is the master of the roster. He is the administrative head. So he is the one who allocates the cases. He is the one who appoints the judges and he is the one who says that these are the judges who will be in the panel and these will be the ones who will be hearing that particular case. So what we have is in this constitutional bench or any number of benches, the master of the roster is the Chief Justice of India and it is his administrative powers to give or allocate cases to the judges in this case. So what we are looking in this case is or what the study is basically saying is when there is a constitutional bench that is set up or any of the benches that is set up by default in case there is a constitutional bench there is Chief Justice of India. So apart from the Chief Justice of India do we have the other four judges. So these four judges 
are the part of the collegium so are these judges represented in that bench if they are represented it is fair and fine if it is not represented then that means there is preferential allocation of the cases is what is being proved in this particular study so what is a major objective are these four judges being allocated in the number of benches are they allocated in these benches or they are not if they are allocated in the benches then fair and fine if they are not allocated in the bench that is on the larger bench when the cgi forms the topmost ranking that is two three four and five the part of the collegium are they represented in this bench is this whole contention about so let's try and understand this with respect to the statistics so what do we have with respect to the statistics let's take the term of deepak mishra so what happens is the person who is the master of the roster so he is the one who is allocating the cases so up till jan 2018 that is before the top most senior most judges came up and had a media conference the number of people that is the top most judges who were part of this constitutional bench or a part of the bench were only 29.3% that is one of the members that is amongst the top four they are part of hearing to these cases so that is very less and that is at a very low rate of 29.3% and after they held up this particular bench that is after they came out in the media and they said that there was preferential treatment that was happening then it increased to about 33.9% and the worst performing was in the year 1990 and that was during but cgi patnayak's term and that was about 29.2% but there is a catch here what is the catch here the catch here is when cgi patnayak was there he was there as a chief justice of india just for one month so this cannot be taken as a major consideration but with respect to chief justice deepak mishra the number of top ranking judges represented in the bench or in the constitutional matters is comparatively less so what this or what extraction that we would be able to make is that the topmost judges who are there in the hierarchy after the chief justice of india the number of people that is these judges being represented in the benches is comparatively less and that is what is being proved in this study so apart from this who are the highest five so in the case of rajendra babu 60% has been the case the collegium that is one member in the top four whoever is a top four judges one member is part of listening to in this particular bench. bench and with reference to as anand it is 63.5% with reference to balakrishnan it was 65.1% with reference to rm lodha it is 67.5% and with reference to hchal dattu it is about 68% when you compare all these studies what we have with reference to deepak misra is that it is only 29.3% so it is a very comparatively very less rate right the top judges who are there part of the listening and this bench that is being set up by Deepak Mishra does not even have the topmost judges that is those who are part of the collegium so when you look into overall judgments as to what has happened from 1990 what we will realize is that there were over 2400 such judgments between January 1999 and July 2018 of which 224 were delivered by the constitutional benches so what is a constitutional bench it is involving five judges or more so this involves any interpretation of of the constitution so if there is any interpretation of the constitution and this interpretation will require minimum of five judges so in case it's a question of is it right is it not is this a fundamental right is it not and if there is any interpretation of the constitution and this interpretation will require minimum of five judges or more than that and all this is important from the prelims perspective so in case there is a question that how many members are there in the constitutional bench the minimum is five judges five judges have to be there so this is important from the prelims perspective as well and what it goes on to say is that the average representation for the collegium judges in major cases was 52.5% in this period so kindly remember this factual data so this is all we will have to understand from this article so moving ahead let's look into the next article so the next article says bis to set standards for the services sector 2 so first point that we need to 
understand is what is the Bureau of Indian Standards. So let's understand something with respect to the prelims facts. So the BIS is the National Standard Body of India established under the BIS Act of 1986 for the harmonious development of activities of standardization, marking and quality certification of goods and for matters connected with it and the BIS has been providing traceability and tangibility benefits to the national economy so this can also be taken as a significant aspect of the BIS or the merits or the advantages why was it established so when we realize that it says it provides the safe reliable quality goods, minimizing the health assaults to the consumers, promoting exports and import substitute, control over the proliferation of the varieties through standardization, certification as well as testing. So this can be a significant aspect as well as the advantages of why BIS is established. And one of the other important point from the prelims perspective is it is headquartered at New Delhi. So kindly remember these facts. So as of now, what the BIS or the Bureau of Indian Standards is currently doing is it is looking into the goods part and it is not currently looking into the services part and that is why it is planning to enter this domain. So the whole idea is as of now the current status is it is only looking into the goods part that is starting off from the gold to the bottled water whatsoever it is but currently what it is planning to enroll itself is getting the service sector under its purview. So one of the reasons as to why this is being done is currently there are number of services which do not have a basic framework and even if there is framework the quality or the output that is resultant of it is comparatively bad so in order to make sure that they are formulating a framework for the quality services and in order to set a benchmark and in order to make sure that all the complaints that are coming through the service sector are addressed and that is why there is establishment or there is talk with the industries as well as the other major stakeholders to make sure that DBIS also enters into the domain of service sector. So what are the service sector things that it is planning to enter into? It will focus on dual champion service sector and that will involve IT, tourism, hospitality, transport and logistics, accounting and finance services, legal services, communication services as well as construction. So it will be entering all these domains in order to make sure that there is quality and when there is a framework all these service sector domains are following that so there is quality output. So what is the structure that it is planning to come up with? So when we look into the structure what it will planning to come up with is it will have a divisional council. So it will have a divisional council under the divisional council what it will have is the technical committee so there will be technical committee that will be established for each service so let's say if we are having legal services there will be a technical committee let's say if you are speaking about the communication services there will be a technical committee if it is logistics there will be a technical committee so there will be technical committee for literally every service that is there in the domain that is falling under its purview and after that is done there will be again consultation so this technical committee will have further stakeholders and this will involve the government officials the experts as well as the industry representatives so the larger perspective is you have the divisional council then under it comes the technical committee under it you will have all the stakeholders who will be making sure that this is a successful program so what we need to also understand is what was the whole necessity I mean it was all going fine but what is the whole idea of getting this right now that is service sector was not under its purview but why is service sector being included under its purview is the question that pops up so what is the overall idea the basic idea is there is concerns over lack of standardization particularly with regards to after sales so the main point as to why the problem is that there is a product let's say for example we buy number of product let's say I buy a Moto phone or I'm buying a Lenovo phone so these are the phones they are selling it and once the after the selling is done there is after sales problem say for example you're not able to hear or there is a problem with the motherboard so something is not working fine off all these complaints are not being addressed so the product is sold but the problem is after it is sold there are services that they need to provide and this is where the problem is because they are not able to provide these services 
that's the major contention and that is why the BIS wants service sector also to come into the picture. So there was one of the polls that was conducted and this was conducted by a local circles and this is a, uh, one of the online portfolios that you have online websites which will take the feedback from all the people and on that basis it will provide certain statistics so what does it say is as per the poll 43 percent of the people feel that mobile handset or the computer manufacturers are the worst in the say after sales services and this is followed by the white good firms which includes the refrigerators the acs and so on and then you have the automobile companies and about 93 percent of the respondents said brand and should at least have knowledge complaints from users within 72 hours and they also felt that many consumers complain that customer service numbers of many companies do not even work so you have a product you have sold a product when I have an issue whom should I consult there is no customer care number and there is no way that I'm getting out of it so I am stuck up in this dilemma as to whom should I approach that's where the problem is so the problem right now that we are facing is after the sale so after the sales the problem is in case I feel or any individual feels there is a problem whom to approach for this problem and if there is a problem how is that this problem is sorted out so in order to address all these issues that is why BIS is venturing into the domain of services this is all we will have to understand with respect to this article so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article says why does Kerala need more funds this is a factual information information I mean just understanding purposes so once we understand a basic view in case there is a question just put across why funds is important from the disaster management plan so when we look into the current funding status what we will realize is that the central government has almost given about 600 crores and the state government had almost asked about 2600 crores but the central government has currently given about 600 crores and the chief minister's disaster relief fund has got around 535 crores by way of donations by individuals institutions and organizations across the world so who are the most hit in this so when we look into who are the most hit people in this it is the middle class who are the most hit in all these domains so with virtually no experience in handling how disaster actually functions it is the middle class who are the most hit why the simple reason is because when we look into how exactly the thing works out what happens is you have the lower class and this lower class comes under the preview of the government support and then you have the higher class because they are comparatively at the economical advantage these people would be able to at least take it up to some extent so you have the lower class where the government is taking care of them and then you also have the higher class where the higher class would be able to absorb certain impact but the worst hit are the people that is the middle class who are a not able to find themselves incapable of rebuilding their shattered lives and what we are understanding in this is that what are the other segments that are also have problem with respect to the recent devastation of the floods so when we look into the various sectors what we will understand is that there are number of micro small and medium enterprises that are badly affected and apart from this what we see is the preliminary estimate of the crop loss is pegged at about 1345 crores and more than 3 lakh farmers suffered damage to various crops spread over 56,439 hectares and then it further says the agricultural department has proposed an assistance of 233.8 crores to compensate for the farmers so what we will have to understand is how is that the government is planning to overcome this so what will currently happen is that the central government has also asked one of the reports from the state government so the state government will have to look into all the damages that has been reported and once the damage report is being conducted what you will have is there is a committee that will be appointed under the cabinet secretary so this will access all the damages so the state government will give it to the central government so this committee headed by the cabinet secretary will look into the damages then it will also recommend to the central government and the central government after looking into it will further dispatch the money so this is being done 
dealt only because in case there is a question we should also know what are the segments or what are the class of people who will be affected the most in this disaster program so this is all we will have to know with respect to this article so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article says about the venezuela inflation crisis so what is happening so when we look into the context what the context goes on to say is that there is a lot of hyperinflation there is power cuts and there is food and medicine shortages and at the same time people are leaving venezuela and number of people are driven out of this country and they are moving into another country so venezuela is facing a large scale problems with respect to the inflation so when we look into the picture what the picture shows is in case you are able to get the currency of the venezuela that is boliviro what you will get is the whole amount that is chunks and chunks of notes that is there will be only able to get 1 kg of carrot for you so look at the inflation rate so it is in the hyper inflation mode the international monetary fund has predicts that the prices will soar by an almost inconceivable 10 lakh percent in venezuela this year and what the picture shows is that 1 kg of carrots next to 30 lakh bolivars so what is happening is there is highest inflation within this region so what we will have to understand is the context and then we will be discussing as to why there is a large scale inflation in this country so one of the concerns that we need to understand is that the biggest problem facing venezuela is the hyper inflation and then this is almost that is when you consider the 1 us dollar this is almost equal to 2 lakh 48 thousand venezuela's bolivars so these prices have been doubling every 26 days on an average even buying a single cup of coffee will need to give 2.5 million bolivars so the hyper inflation has caused a lot of disturbance in the economy of venezuela so what is the major causes so when we look into what are the major causes first thing that pops up is venezuela is living on petrol so what happens is venezuela's economy is majorly sticking on to petrol so it is an export economy so what is happening is majority that is almost up to 95% of its economy is staying or is the background of the economy is the export sector of the petrol so it has large scale reservation of petrol so what it does is it exports the petrol or all the oil reserves that is had to other countries and once these people pay back the money then that is how they are able to run the economy but what's happening from 2013 and 14 is because the venezuelan economy is based only on exports of petrol there is drop with respect to the petrol rate so when we go back to 2013 and 14 what was at the scale of almost 100 dollars reached to almost about 28.36 dollars so this was the lowest point that it saw so what was at a very high earning rate so they were earning a lot because of their export economy that is based on petrol but suddenly there was a large scale dip and this dip was almost up to as low as 28.36 so because their economy was completely based on petrol and because the rate of petrols were comparatively dropped they were not able to sustain the momentum and because they were not able to sustain the momentum and also they didn't have to invest in other domains let's say for example any country for that matter will have alternatives let's say the agricultural sector or the infrastructural sector or the industrial sector so we do have other portfolios or sectors where we actually invest the money in but what was happening in venezuela is they were completely banking only on petrols and because there was a complete drop in the rate or the price of petrol they were not able to stand and because they were not able to stand they were not able to import the agricultural goods they were not able to include the pharmaceutical industry medicines and all this was a major problem now because they were not able to import all this there was more demand for the same product and because there was more demand for the same product there was sudden spike in the prices of those goods and because there was sudden spike in the goods price what was here reflecting is the hyper inflation so all their economy was completely based on petrol and that's the prime reason and major factor as to why their inflation is at the hyper inflation level and that is why even the imf has said that their prices will almost soar to inconceivable 10 lakh percent in venezuela so the prime factor is with respect to 
petrol and the second most important factor that we will have to consider is with respect to the corruption so when you consider what is the most important factor with respect to the corruption what we will realize is the transparency international has ranked this country to be the ninth most corrupted country so there are certain politicians and it is their family and the immediate support group that is taking a large scale money and they are not providing the same to the people and when there is large scale corruption what will happen is a large number of people will be without food and it is only few people who will siphon off all the money and the second important factor is with reference to the corruption and the third important factor is it is the administration so what we realize is that venezuela is a socialist economy so what is happening in this case is they always want to take care of the people so because they want to take care of the people and they do not have all the sectors supporting it and what do they do so they started go on printing the money and because they started printing the money there was more money in the market and when there is more money in the market this will obviously result in the inflation and apart from this there were number of welfare schemes and these welfare schemes did not have a proper managerial structure and there was not proper implementation and because of this this also resulted in a large scale inflation and apart from this what we need to also provide is that these people because they believe in the socialistic nature they wanted to provide pension to the people and because they started providing a large scale pension all these things started reflecting in the hyper inflation and apart from this what we need to consider is the credit factor so the government of venezuela would have taken credit from other multilateral organizations so these multilateral organizations obviously expect you to pay back the principal and the interest rate but what is happening in this case is because they are not able to take care of their economy they are not even paying back the money and that is resultant of the hyper inflation and because they are not able to pay back the money what is happening in this case is that these groups or the organizations multilateral organizations are not donating to the venezuela and because they are not able to get the credit they are not able to make sure that the infrastructural growth is happening or there is no segment growth that is happening within this domain and the most important point of all is the investment factor let's say i am a person who is a businessman so what do i do as a person uh, from a business background what i look for is the benefits or for the profits so in case i am a person who want to invest in any of the developing countries i would see what is the profit that i would be generating if i am investing in a particular country because their bond rates are comparatively bad because there is hyper inflation and now nothing is working out in venezuela people and investment from the business background is comparatively low and when there is no investment there is no employment and when there is no employment this can result in devastation in the economy so all these segments put together is why the venezuelan economy is in crisis so what we will also have to consider is there are number of things that has been spoken about venezuela and one of the important terms that we need to consider is what is banana republic so when we consider what is banana republic what we need to consider is in case there is any economy or in case there is any country which is basically based on agriculture so they are exporting or they are based on only agriculture and they are exporting only minimal number of products in agriculture or they are based with respect to a certain minerals let's say for example in this particular case they are mostly based on petrol right so in these economies are called as the banana republics or those economies which rely on only primarily the agricultural sector or certain crops in the agricultural sector or on the basis of minerals these segments are called are these republics are called as banana republic so this is one of the terms because number of countries also address venezuela as a rep banana republic that's why i've just made sure that this is also covered so moving ahead let's look into the next art so let's look into this article so this article is about the fall of a florican this is on the additional sheet not in the main sheet this is on the additional sheet so let's understand two things one is with respect to the bengal florican the other one is with reference to the great indian bastard so one of the important factors from the prelims perspective is we need to understand the iucn status of the bengal florican 
and is critically endangered. So it is a bustard species na native to the Indian subcontinent, Cambodia as well as Vietnam. It inhabits lowland, dry or seasonally inundated natural and semi-natural grasslands often interspersed with scattered scrub or patchy open forest the key threats so what are the threats to these so the key threats are extensive loss and modification of grasslands through drainage conversion to agriculture and plantations overgrazing inappropriate cutting burning and plowing regimes heavy flooding invasion of alien species scrub expansion dam construction and inappropriate and illegal development so other important causes are the shift from the traditional crops like the lentils to the legumes to cash crops like soya and cotton led to intensive use of pesticides killing of the insects that dominates the birds diet so what happens is this is one of the birds which lives in the grasslands so what happens is because we are converting these grasslands into agricultural food and because we are also moving from lentils and legumes to the cotton this will require a large spraying of pesticides and when there is large spraying of pesticides this will result into deaths of the insects but the problem is all these birds were actually feeding on these insects and when there is death of the insects there will not be a diet that is there is loss of the insect insects and that is why the they have no food in this particular case and also changing crop patterns and agricultural practices have also affected this bird and apart from this there is also the great indian bustard or the indian bustard the iocn is the critically endangered countries of occurrences india and pakistan it inhabits arid and semi arid grasslands which catered short scrub bushes and low intensity cultivation in flat or gently undulating terrain birds congregate in traditional grassland patches which are less distributed to breed during mid summer and monsoon and historically widespread hunt for sport and food precipitated its decline accelerated by the vehicular access to remote areas and high intensity poaching that is a cause of concern in pakistan is why there is grave concern for this great indian bustard or the indian concern so what is that strategies to save them so strategies being measures to save the bird have to be flexible multi layered and site specific a sensitive and inclusive approach that takes into account the difficulties that local communities face is important so there are number of local communities which are actually taking care of these birds so try to understand what are the problems they face and in case they are facing any problems address these problems so they are able to conserve these birds is one of the calls that is being said and apart from this core breeding areas must be inviolate and protected from overgrazing and also other or anthropogenic pressure that is the human pressure and it further says other potential breeding sites need to be protected and restored and further floricon habitats must be declared eco sensitive zones to regulate land use and development so these are some of the strategies this is just plain understanding so this is all we will have to understand from the article so kindly visit the byju cna look into the practice questions both pre as well as mains write all your answers on the comment section so that we can evaluate and give you the relevant feedback for the same so this is it for today thank you so much all the best